Hey, Digging for Kryptonite YouTube audience. It's your host, Anthony Desiato here with a quick message before we get into this week's all new installment. First and foremost, whether you are a regular viewer of the podcast on YouTube or you just stumbled across this episode, thank you very much for checking it out. I wanted to let you know that in March 2022, I will be ending the video versions of the podcast. The podcast itself is not going anywhere. However, it will continue exclusively as an audio only podcast. Previously, I've been putting out both versions of the show, but beginning in March 2022, it will only be available in audio form. So what that means is, if you are not currently subscribed to Digging for Kryptonite, a Superman fan journey via one of the audio podcast platforms, please make sure you subscribe. I'm putting out this notice as early as possible to prep people and give everyone enough notice so that if they're not on one of those audio podcast platforms, they have an opportunity to do so. The show is available on all major podcast platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and more. So please, if you're not currently subscribed, please make sure you go and take care of that. Please keep your subscription to the Anthony Desiato YouTube channel. I will continue to utilize the channel uh, for a variety of, of different types of videos, but it simply won't be the full video edition of the podcast. Um, and there were a number of factors that went into that decision. But at the end of the day, I felt that it was most effective for me to really focus my uh, time and resources and energies into the traditional classic audio version of the podcast. That being said, I really had a great time creating these video versions of the show. And the majority of the audience seemed to consume the show via the, the audio platforms. But for anyone who regularly watched these shows or maybe just watched a few minutes here and there, whatever the case may be, thank you so much. I really, really do appreciate it. And my understanding is that at least some of you discovered the show through YouTube. Uh, so so thank you so much to the YouTube audience. And I'm so proud of the, the library of video podcasts that uh, will remain on the Anthony Desiato YouTube channel. And my sincere hope is that other people will continue to find Digging for Kryptonite and then come join us on the audio side. So again, March 2022 will mark the end of the video versions of Digging for Kryptonite. If you're not currently subscribed via Apple Podcasts or any of the other platforms, please make sure you subscribe. Thank you for all of the support, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to Digging for Kryptonite, a Superman fan journey 2022. I am your host, Anthony Desiato. Joining me for Superman the Animated Mixtapes Volume 1 is returning guest, Jeremy Frutkin. Welcome back, sir. Anthony, look up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Jeremy and Anthony back at it again to talk some Superman. It's going to be a good day, my friend. Kicking off this year, 2022, having a good time, talking shop. It's going to be a good one, man. I'm excited to be here. I'm so excited to have you, not just for this episode, but for five episodes. We are doing a five-episode event to kick off 2022, all about Superman, the animated series, which as fans are likely aware, uh, towards the end of 2021, celebrated its 25th anniversary. Isn't that something? It's staggering. And yes. you know, we are, of course, talking about the animated series uh, from Warner Brothers Animation and producer Bruce Timm that ran from 96 to 2000 uh, for 54 episodes and starred the voices of Tim Daly, Dana Delaney, Clancy Brown, and many others. And... At the top, I called this Superman the Animated Mixtapes because our approach for these five episodes is a little bit different than an episode-by-episode episode rewatch, which I toyed with for a hot second, and then and we talked about it, and we, we both settled on this, and 1,000% this was the way to go. I, I've had a lot of fun with my rewatch so far. I'm dying to hear what your thoughts have been, uh, but would you actually like to explain to our audience what our approach is with this mixtape model? And I want to give you the credit for mixtape because... I was originally saying remix, and we talked about it, and you uh, you convinced me that mixtapes was the way to go. So uh, what do we mean by mixtapes? Well, you know, I'm glad you asked, and probably that's partially to blame from our last journey into animation in the 80s. Maybe I had that kind of old school mixtape on my mind. But, you know, I was always taught when you love somebody, you make them a mixtape. That's just me being old school. We love our listeners. We love our viewers. So we're making all of you some mixtapes, kicking it old school. What we decided to do in the sake of of having a good conversation and an interesting conversation. Instead of going through bit by bit by bit and going over every single episode, we've broken it down into themes. So each of these five episodes are gonna have a distinct theme and a motif 
that collects all these episodes from across the three seasons of Superman the Animated Series. So you're going to be in for some very, very interesting topics, and I'm very, very excited to discuss not only the topics in the ser- in the episodes, but as we discussed, it gives us such an interesting conversation starter to see how these episodes and characters really are directly relating to each other, bouncing off each other, and showing growth as the series goes along. Thank you for that beautiful encapsulation of, of our approach. That's totally what we're doing. And for this first episode, we are talking about episodes that deal with Krypton specifically. And the episodes uh, that we watched to talk about for this uh, part one of the animated mixtapes is uh, The Last Son of Krypton parts one and two. So the first two installments of that three-part series premiere, Stolen Memories, Blast from the Past uh, parts one and two, Ghost in the Machine, New Kids in Town, and Absolute Power. And just to give a sense of where we're going in the episodes to come, we have other mixtapes centered around the supporting cast, the rest of the DC universe, the new gods, and the Superman uh, rogues gallery. So that's sort of where we're headed over these five episodes. You know, not to not to give us too much credit. I mean, it's not like we uh, reinvented the wheel here with this, but I really, really am enjoying this way of taking in the series. I'm really, really liking it. How have you been finding it so far? Oh, I've absolutely loved it. I've absolutely loved it. It's um, It's been so much more fun to see. So uh, with the Timverse, as we call it, right? They've done such a good job throughout Superman. And in case anybody who's watching might not have grown up with this or might not know that uh, the Superman animated series falls after the Batman animated series. Uh, in terms of like the timeline, but that actually would go on for another, oh boy, almost another 10 years ish, right? I don't know the exact end point of Justice League Unlimited, but I believe it was still going into the mid 2000s, if I'm not mistaken. So it was going for quite a while and they, um, they've they created such a long, rich continuity. So the point of all that being as it relates to what we're doing is they are master storytellers in the show and they mastered the art of a style of long form storytelling and animation that is still rare today and was even rarer at the time. So what's so cool of what we're doing is we're immediately seeing over what would normally be the course of months and sometimes years, we're actually seeing kind of like these arcs with these themes play out. So it's been so rewarding. And uh, I also think that, um, you know, we we're doing this obviously for our, our listeners and our viewers, but I really think that it bodes well that if we're having more fun, I think also they should have fun. And, you know, we always say this when we get together. I encourage everybody, if you have not watched this show, you can go ahead and hit pause, maybe watch a few episodes, maybe watch the whole thing and come on back because you're going to be in for some fun. That's the thing. I mean, if anyone, I mean, I would be shocked if someone hasn't seen the animated series at all and is a regular consumer of this podcast, but it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. I will say, though, if anyone has never watched Superman, the animated series, I'd probably say to watch it in order. But if you are interested in a rewatch, kind of using our uh, our mixtapes as a guide, I do think is a good way to go. Like, it really has been fun. You know, I was thinking back on how I originally watched the show, and I wanted to compare notes with you because I suspect it's probably similar. You and I are just about the same age, so I feel like we have sort of a similar frame of reference for all of this stuff. But, um, you know, prior to your rewatch for this podcast, before all that, what role, if at, well, I, not if any, because I know it did play a role, but what was the role that Superman the Animated Series played for you on your Superman fan journey when you were originally watching it? Sure. So I primarily, and we've talked about this, I think, briefly as well, too. Um, I primarily first started reading Marvel comics in the early 90s, right? It was the X-Men animated series that got its claws into me and propelled me into comic books in general. Uh, Like a lot of us in the 90s, you know, I'm sure I'm not alone in that fact by a long shot. I know hearing some of your other wonderful guests on the show too that I'm not alone on that by a long shot, which is also cool to be in good company. From that though, a very similar thing also happened with Superman the animated series. I distinctly remember it being like a Saturday morning in 1996 
going down to my kitchen, putting on the little TV there, which probably people, you know, we looked at today would probably laugh at. It was the WB. Of course, they had Michigan J Frog singing and dancing on there. And it was just part of my my weekly routine. It was just a part of, of my life. It was something to look forward to every morning. And Superman as somebody, uh, as a character is, aside from Mickey Mouse, I think you really would have a hard time arguing somebody that's that's really is larger than life in our, our Americana and our American culture, you know, and it's so easy to forget that like he is a character, but there's so much depth and nuance and a whole world also around him. And I think I've said this before in the many times that we talk, I think more often than not, the very biggest stars in the Superman universe are that supporting cast. And I fell in love, not just with Superman from this show, but with the world and the characters around them, around him, I should say. They, this show does such a wonderful job of creating characters that are easily to, easy to engage with, uh, are compelling, but are also completely and easily understandable. And this is a good enough time as any to throw this in. I'll, I'll throw this in as my, my first pitch at the series. If somebody, and again, this would be impossible, especially to the listeners of, and viewers of our, our show here, that if somebody had never seen Superman before, I don't think there is a better way to introduce somebody who's never read a comic book or seen a movie or show. I don't think there's a better way to introduce them to Superman than Superman the Animated Series. I would very likely agree with that. As much as there are other incarnations that have made a larger impression on me personally, I, I do think this is such a beautiful classic iconic representation of the character and to your point and we'll get into this a lot more over these episodes the world and the supporting cast that mm -hmm. i think it would work fantastic in in that respect uh so yeah i i would agree and i would say that i think our experiences are aligned in terms of you know again sort of our, our age and how it was part of our routine i guess i came to it differently because i you know, Superman was my favorite character coming into this cartoon, right? So it ran from 96 to 2000. So that was for me ages nine to 13. Yep. I had been reading the Superman comics. Um, I had watched Lois and Clark, the new adventures of Superman. I was, I was very young for that. So I think there was a lot there that, you know, sorry, I'm sorry you had to go through with that at such a, a young age I had to deal with watching <laughs> that show. It worked in its own way, even at that time. But <laughs> I think now as I rewatch it and as of this recording, I am getting ready. I'm gearing up to start a rewatch uh, project with my wife, and we'll be podcasting about it on the Patreon. I'm channel. so I'm so excited for that. It's such a wonderful idea. It'll be a lot of fun. I'm really excited. Yep. Uh, by the time people are hearing this, I will have likely already started that viewing project. As of this recording, I have not. Uh, so I know I'll get something a lot different out of it now as a married adult than I did as a kid when I first watched it. But again, you know, I was reading the comics, the you know the the Triangle Era, the Death of Superman, that all of that that we've talked about. So I was reading the comics, I had watched Lois and Clark, and then I remember watching that three-part premiere in prime time uh, when they originally debuted it. I, I have a memory of watching that. And then I watched it regularly. I mean, I remember watching it both on Saturday mornings and also weekday afternoons, and I have probably more memories of watching it weekday afternoons than I do Saturday mornings. Um, but I watched it, you know, uh, you know, both times and I suspect like I probably saw most, if not all of the episodes during that time period. And then a few years after that, you know, they, they put out, they put them all out on DVD. And I remember rewatching the series on DVD at maybe like late high school or early college at the latest. And that was about it. So, you know, it's been close to 15 years since I really sat down and watched this show in any meaningful way same. and coming to it now. And we were messaging about this. I think we, we had the same takeaway. I always liked the show. I was never down on it. I always enjoyed Superman, the animated series, but I think I always took it a bit for granted. And I don't think I ever really appreciated just how good it was or what it yep. was accomplishing until now. Is that a similar experience that you've had over the course without of this project? A, without a doubt. And I'll take it a step further. And I'm curious to, to, to hear your thoughts and also our viewers and listeners' thoughts as well. I think a big part of that is, is because Batman the Animated Series 
and then Justice League into Justice League Unlimited took its lunch money. This show got so it was only three seasons of Superman the Animated Series. I think those shows and their acclaim, Batman for being first, Justice League for being huge, huge in terms of both cast, roster, comic book fidelity, and and continuity and storytelling. I think Superman just kind of in the middle there got overshadowed. I think it really just got overshadowed. And now going back, I, I really appreciate it so much more now than I did. And I rewatched the Justice League, or I guess it was still coming out or maybe just ending coming out when I was in college. So I, I've, I've rewatched the Justice League episodes and I still had never gone back and watched Superman. And I really was thinking as I was watching, I really wonder if that's why, you know, Batman's first, it gets all the credit and rightfully so, so that, that show is wonderful. You know, don't get me wrong. But I, I really think that's that's part of the reason. And I'm so glad we have this opportunity. I always get so worried with nostalgia, right? We're both very nostalgic people, clearly, obviously. You know, it, it, that's part of uh, everybody our age. You know, nostalgia sells. I mean, if you look at the box office, you look at pretty much everything with media, especially for our demographic, we're probably the target for that. You're always worried to go back to something because was it as good as you remember or was it because it was such a part of our childhood? And such of that that great period in our lives. And I'm happy to report that it's fantastic still. And it's still worthy of your time and your effort. And yeah, I appreciate it more now than I did then. Same. And I, you know, with this podcast especially, I'm always worried when I go back to one of these things that I have such affection for as a kid. Because it's exactly what you just articulated. It's like, you know, do I... Do I have that because of the time in my life, you know, when I first consumed it, will it actually hold up? And, you know, sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's a mix, right? Sometimes, you know, you, you find something different, right? You're able to enjoy it in a, in a different way. But yeah, I, I do always think about that. And I, I do really agree with your assessment. I think where it fell in terms of timing, accolades, quality, you know, between Batman and, and Justice League, I think that might account for maybe why we, we kind of looked at it that way. Um, and that's sort of where it seems to fall in the conversation. Although I'll be honest, it was really, really cool when the 25th anniversary hit, you know, a few months ago to see on social media, like all the love for, uh, for Superman, the animated series. So the fans are definitely sure. out there and rightfully so. And I want to give a quick shout out to uh, Superman, the animated podcast. So you and I are not doing an episode by episode rewatch, but for anyone out there who is interested in that, <laughs> check out Superman, the animated podcast. Um, I was a guest on one of the episodes and we actually talked about new kids in town, which is one of the ones you and I will be talking about now. Uh, yep. And, yep. And it was really, really fun. Uh, I was also a guest on the always hold on to Smallville podcast recently. And we talked about uh, one of the season seven episodes of Smallville with both of those shows you know, they're not what I do here, right? I don't do an episode by episode breakdown, but to be able to do that on someone else's show as a guest was really fun. Like I really liked it. Uh, so I really encourage people to check out both of those shows, but especially if you're a fan of, of Superman, the animated series, check out that podcast. Um, and you know, again, it's episode by episode, so you can really dive in and there's a lot to enjoy. Uh, but they've been lovely too on Twitter and on everything. They just seem like the nicest people. So for sure. Yes. Thank you for pointing that out. Very true. Uh, so again, that was really cool to see all the love for Superman, the animated series when uh, the 25th anniversary hit and they put out the new Blu-ray, um, which I did pick up. Now you watched, did you watch HBO Max or did you pick up? The I did. A HBO Max. I'm a, I'm all, I'm all digital, especially now. You know, I'm in the process of, of moving. The, the less physical stuff I have, the better. My, my lower back thanks me for that. I've gone, this is really a separate conversation, but any of the collectors out there and probably many who would be listening to a podcast like this, I'm sure can identify. I've gone back and forth a lot over the years uh, in terms of the physical versus digital mm -hmm. media. And I'm at the point now where for the vast majority of things, I'm perfectly content streaming or reading digitally, whatever the case may be. But when there's something I really, really care about, those are the things that I want to make sure I have a physical copy of in my library. And to be honest, at this point, it's not a lot of stuff that falls into that category, but the Superman material does. So I did pick up the animated series Blu-ray. And Jeremy, I'll be honest, it was an interesting experiment because for years now, I've been very used to just streaming and you have everything, you know, at, at, the, at the click of a button. And it was like the old days. I'm getting up and I'm switching out discs and I'm waiting for the menu to load the DVD player to the couch seemed much, much further away than it used to be, right? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to lie. It was, it's, it's been a little bit of a hassle. Uh, I mean, I've watched the episodes for, obviously, for this podcast we're doing now and also for our next one. So I'm one ahead. You're way ahead of me. I th- have you finished all of them by now or just about? Not, no, not, not all. all. I'm, um, I'm pro, I think I'm close to f- on four, epi- what will be episode four, okay. I believe. So I'm, I'm a good ways in. Gotcha. Uh, but you know, so I've watched like two podcast episodes worth of Superman, the animated series episodes. And, uh, recently I sort of gave up and I just switched to HBO max, but I will say, and I think this is probably, it might be in my head. It might be some wishful thinking, uh, to justify the cost of the Blu-ray and to justify the time I've been spending to switch them out. The picture quality, I do have to give the edge to the Blu-ray. So I believe that. You know, I believe that. So there is there is something to be said for that. So uh, you know, so that's we'll score one for the for the physical media. Well, and and like you said, if it's something special and worthy, I think uh, this show and what we're doing here, check check check. So yes. that makes perfect sense to me. The other thing too, I was I was really reflecting on this, you know, especially when you were talking about you know your original feelings towards this cartoon, and I was thinking about it for myself as well. I think that. F- I think for me, it probably had a, it probably had less to do with Batman and Justice League, but just looking at the Superman show in and of itself, I feel like I was always a huge fan, and I think when I'm done with my rewatch, I'll still feel this way, of the New Gods episodes. Oh boy, I'm excited, Anthony. I'm so excited you're saying these words to me. And But I think that kind of almost worked against me originally, because those episodes were so strong and emotional and resonant and the stakes were high and they were so action packed. Like those were big, big episodes that I think for me, it often made a lot of the other episodes feel a bit like ho-hum as a a kid. And now though, watching them, I, I really can appreciate what Bruce Tim and the and the writers and the direct but what all of them were were building there and they were building again this beautiful encapsulation of the Superman mythology and I have even more respect for them now because I didn't really think about this at the time but you know we're we're talking 90s here so in the comics you know Superman had died and came back he had the long hair you know yep. short shortly into the run of Superman the animated series he would get the electric powers and then yeah. split into Superman red and blue. You know, there was a lot of stuff going on. And, and I was reading, it's probably like the IMDb trivia. I don't know if this is 100% accurate, but this is what IMDb says. That I guess DC was pushing for Bruce Tim to use the longer hair uh, for, mm. for Superman in the cartoon to match the comics. And Tim really pushed back against that because he figured, well, that will eventually go away. As much as DC is insisting this is permanent. I mean, taking the long view, that's the way to do it. Right, right. And he was right. And, you know, I I would not have minded the long hair, to be perfectly honest, but it just gave me a lot of respect for for what they fought for and what they were ultimately able to create because this doesn't feel like a product of its time, of the 90s. It's it's timeless. It's so timeless, you know, and it's 25 years old, but, you know, you watch it, it doesn't feel dated. It doesn't feel tied to the comics of the time. Like, it really just stands on its own and that's probably like my, probably my biggest takeaway, and I'm just so impressed with, with what they did. It's it's truly remarkable, and let me tell you, I'm so excited to talk about the new gods with you <laughs> because I have read so little about the new gods, and I had mentioned this, mentioned this to you in a message as well when I was watching these episodes. I fell down such a rabbit hole because of what a wonderful job they did with the new gods and the new gods episodes. I was just online just looking at every bit of information and history on all of these characters that I could find and what comics three were. At some point now, I'm going to do a read of all of the new gods material I could find either on uh, the DC app or elsewhere. I mean, they, they did just such a good job presentation wise, like they do with all the characters, like you're saying of, of making you interested, but also making them easily understandable. But knowing that a whole deeper universe is there with comic books for you to dive into at any time, which is why I really think the show is just such a perfect entry point for anybody. Yes. And the last thing I want to say sort of big picture wise, before we dive into the the Krypton episodes that we've, we've earmarked for this episode is, you know, the, I guess the last time you were on, uh, we talked about the Ruby Spears Superman cartoon from the late eighties. And one of the things that we talked about there was how that cartoon in particular was designed to be, and and in fact was, 
really this amalgam of the, at that point, 50 years worth of Superman continuity and mythology. It really borrowed from almost everything that came before, and it came out on the character's 50th anniversary, and, you know, I, I think it, it succeeded in being that celebration of 50 years. But looking at Superman the Animated Series, boy, there's a lot of the same the same work at play there. And again, that was another thing that I really was not cognizant of as a kid watching this. But looking at it now, you know, and we're going to talk about Krypton, but the Krypton we get here harkens back much more to the Silver Age uh, of DC Comics than it does yep. the then current John Byrne reimagining. Um, mm -hmm. Yet we get a very modern Lex Luthor that comes right out of the pages of the, the Burn reinvention. Mm -hmm. um, the animation, the fluidity, the elegance of, of the animation, um, you know, so conjures the Fleischer cartoons uh, that, that all of us love so much. And the characterization of Clark and even Superman to, extent, to an extent reminded me a lot of the George Reeves Adventures of Superman television show. I mean, this was, this was a tougher Clark. He was not tripping all over himself. He was competent. He was capable. Um, and as, Superman, as we like him, as we've discussed. As we like him. And mm -hmm. Superman himself, you know, I, I've gone on record and this will always come up on the show. I like, I do like a Superman where there's some inner turmoil or tension, something that he's trying to work out. I know other fans don't always like a more conflicted Superman. The Superman we get in this show is really not conflicted. I mean, it's it again reminds me a lot of the George Reeves incarnation of the character where it's, you know, pretty black and white and he knows what to do and he goes out and he does it. And as much as I do like other depictions where there's a little bit more going on inside, I can very much appreciate this. And I love the George Reeves show. So the ways in which this kind of lined up with that, I, I was really on board with all of that. And I, I guess why you're the master of ceremonies, of course, and uh, the big boss with Superman, because you can see these these big pictures over generations through the same art form, right? Through the animation over the decades and seeing not what makes them different, but how they're all connected, which I think is a very important thing. And you kind of hit the nail on the head. I think these shows greatly succeed when they're not tied into those specific moments to the comics. And I think that's maybe part of the reason why our uh, last watch in the 80s with the Ruby Spears show maybe got a little tangled up with, you know, not to be able to prove, and there was, you know, very little information, comparatively speaking, but it seemed like there was a lot of cooks in the kitchen on uh, on that show and uh, other forces uh, at play, certainly. But yeah, I mean, I, I think really that's what, there are some people who have never read a comic book in their entire life and are still just as much a Superman fan and rightfully so, as you or I, because there are so many different ways you can view and understand and appreciate this character, maybe almost more than any other character. I mean, if you look at how many uh, just different forms of media he's been in over the course of, my goodness, I mean, we're, uh, decades upon decades upon decades, and every interpretation of Superman is valid. That's kind of how I look at it. And it's so interesting to see how each one is different and also how they all kind of have that same connective tissue. Uh, regardless of what time period. Well said. And that idea about all of them being valid is something that I think not all fans always ascribe to, but I certainly do. And one of the things that I've really come to appreciate, especially over the course of doing this podcast, is like any version of Superman is someone's favorite. You know, yeah. I largely sat out right. the, the New 52 but I see it on like Twitter all the time, especially, you know, there was recently a, a one of the anniversary, maybe the 10-year anniversary of the New 52. You know, there are people out there where that was their introduction to the character or, that's right. you know, maybe they're even their introduction to comics. So, you know, I think, you know, and I'm, I'm sure, yes, there are probably some outliers uh, in terms of depictions that are just so far afield of, of the core tenets of sure. the character. But I think, the, I think those are the rarities. I mean, I think most of them, for the most part, you know, tap into, you know, some core ideal of the character and there's some value there and it means something to somebody. Um, I said that was a, I have one more big picture thing. Um, now, or, and I, I know we must have talked about this at some point, but um, were you a fan of the Fleischer stuff or did you not really ever get into that? I never really dove too deep into the Fleischer stuff. Okay. Um, that's something I should probably sit down and do a dive in at some point. Um, but I never really dove like too, too deep uh, into the Fleischer stuff. I'm obviously now very curious, uh, especially now even more so, to see kind of like uh, the the connectivity but between everything, especially with uh, the points you just hit on as well. 
Yeah, I, I mean, it's worth it's worth mentioning, not just because I'm wearing my Fleischer sweatshirt right now, but uh, but because it's an awesome, of- awesome sweatshirt, by the way. <laughs> Listen, if you're an audio listener only, you need to stop what you're doing right now within the realms of safety and go check this out because he's got an awesome hoodie on. Continue. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but it, it's worth mentioning, not just because of the hoodie, but because of how much the Fleischer cartoons clearly uh, influenced what Bruce Tim did for this show. Um, That's on our would be one day sponsors to be aren't those on Tubi as well they're like those everywhere cartoons? they're available with there were due to legal issues or lack thereof they're kind of like available everywhere and okay, there cool. are various dvds of varying quality and it's on streaming sites i actually have it on i have the the blu-ray of the superman motion picture anthology which has all yeah. of the christopher reeve movies and superman returns and a ton of bonus stuff including the Fleischer cartoons so oh nice again if you know if anyone needs a quick refresher I mean these were theatrical shorts in the 40s um, by Fleischer Studios only 17 of them uh, were, were made um, and the second half actually happened after a, a split within the company so they're sort of in their own little category but um, you know about 10 minutes in duration each but they are notable for um well, for the budget, uh, they had a far higher budget for that uh, than uh, I think almost anything animation-wise at the time. And it shows. I mean, the animation is just astounding for the 40s. But even now, I mean, they hold up. They're remarkable. They look gorgeous from what I've seen, yeah. And they're largely, you know, they're largely action-based. There's not a ton of dialogue or plot. Um, it's, you know, really Superman, you know, quickly changes from Clark into Superman and rushes into action and um, you know, you know the, the the battle ensues, but again, the the way Superman was animated was just so so fluid and so beautiful, and you see, I think a lot of that at play here. I mean, one of the ways that I think I noticed it the most was Superman's size. You know, he ne- he almost never dominates the screen here. He looks the way he would look if he were flying through this huge metropolitan city, and I see a lot of I see a lot of similarities there. Um, and I, I, this is, I'm sure this has come up on the podcast before, but Bruce Tim originally uh, was planning to, you know, basically take his cues visually um, in terms of the character designs from the Fleischer cartoons. And he actually uh, drew up versions of, of our core cast of characters that were very 40s inspired and they looked like, you know, they were just given a slight update from the Fleischer cartoons. Mm-hmm. And then he ultimately decided not to do that because he felt that people would then really compare his show to Fleischer and it might not be a favorable sure. comparison. And so in the end, I think it was the right choice to make this really its own thing rather than try to force it into being like a quasi sequel to the, to the Fleischer cartoons. But again, really in terms of, you know, some elements of the designs, but you know, really just that style of animation generally. I mean, you really, um, you really see it. There's, I know I'm jumping ahead, but you know when we do our episode on the supporting cast, uh, the episode that introduces the adult Lana Lang, um, there's a point where Superman is saving her from molten lead, and he he covers her, and the uh, the molten lead you know hits his back and 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 kind of spills down over him, and that is is a seems to be a pretty direct homage uh, to something very similar from the Fleischer card. So there are little things like that. So clearly it was a big inspiration. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that uh, for any fans of Fleischer, and I, uh, I think it's a uh, again, it seems like just uh, Tim just keeps having the the wherewithal and foresight with these decisions because I think it wouldn't be as timeless if it was so directly visually connected to the Fleischer cartoons. But by doing an homage with that scene you're talking about right there is a nice little tip of the hat while still having it stand on its own. So it sounds like a good way to kind of split the difference there. For sure. All right. Let's get into the Krypton episodes that we'll be discussing here. So, you know, these eight episodes uh, deal with Krypton and, of course, its destruction with Brainiac, with the Phantom Zone criminals Jaxor and Mala, and, uh, and of course, with Brainiac. And I want to I want to start the big homie Brainiac. I want to start with Brainiac. Uh, I mean, again, we'll circle back and talk about Krypton and its destruction and everything. But I want to talk about Brainiac because uh, you messaged me something that um, was running through my <laughs> my head as well. Uh, would you like to? What was your take on this iteration of Brainiac, where he's an artificial intelligence created on Krypton? Brainiac is my favorite villain 
in Superman the Animated Series. It's not Lex Luthor, and it's even made me reconsider that statement, maybe even as a blanket statement. I'm not quite ready to say, in all, I'm getting there. Brainiac, it's so tough, right? Because this show came out in 1996, and I think a lot of the impetus for a lazier bunch of creators could have been, okay, this guy is the Brainiac. Let's do a bunch of like tech stuff and kind of make it look like what they thought high tuck stuff looked like. Instead, they went the route that I appreciate with Brainiac as they made him decidedly alien. But instead of just making him a thoughtless machine, they did enough work to also give him a motive, which I thought, and a very interesting and important tie that I think more so than Lex Luthor throughout this series makes the argument that he really is Superman's arch nemesis, considering how he's intrinsically tied to Krypton, to his family, to Jor-El. It's just such a part of him. And I love, love, love that take. They also did such a good job of portraying him. And this is going to sound really funny for a, uh, a cartoon show from the 90s, but they did such a good job of portraying him as almost like a horror movie villain. He's just like this, almost like what you would imagine Jason being like in like an R-rated movie. He's an unstoppable force that just, keeps coming and while superman is strong brainiac not only has the power of all of his uh data and intelligence but considering he can kind of upload and put himself everywhere it gives him kind of a certain uh, a different kind of invulnerability as well too he also is not only protected by his tech but but for the the secrets that he keeps about krypton which gives him another point of invulnerability that I think is such a good dichotomy to Superman's physical durability and strength. I mean, they just do such a fantastic job with Brainiac. I was blown away by this character uh, during this rewatch so far. I, I agree with everything. I mean, are you a fan of the character of Brainiac otherwise outside of the show? Not really. It's making me really want to go back and re-examine. Um, I know he likes shrinking cities. I know that was his bag for, for for a while, which to be honest with you, interests me less than everything that I've seen here. You know, even just the one, and stop me if I'm getting too ahead of myself here, even just the one, it's, I think it's one or two lines of dialogue that he says where he has Kal-El in a, kind of like his uh, his ship with him, right? And Kal-El turns to him and says, all you're doing is is selling, is destroying, getting getting the, the information and secrets from these planets and then destroying them. And now they have immeasurable value. And just that line of motivation did more for Brainiac for me than I think anything I've ever read from Brainiac otherwise. When you're like, oh, that's diabolical, but it's also logical and a really good plan. And that makes sense from Brainiac's perspective. The logical thing to do, if I want to increase my value and my bargaining tools and my wealth and my worth, it's all about value. How do you create value by creating scarcity? Like you can follow that logical and like logically that makes sense. Ethically, it's deplorable, but logically it makes perfect sense. And even just that, that little line of dialogue, I was like, whoa, wow. Like that's horrific, but it also makes perfect sense, which is, I guess, a great way to describe Brainiac in this show too. Like he's, he's a horror movie monster but is also still a, a followable has a, a followable executive of logic in him that like you can understand and that's um it's something chilling because i think you can understand that perspective and that's what makes what he's doing all the more horrifying um i'm with you you know and as far as him being this horror movie villain even that little musical stinger that accompanies yes. him every time yes. it's yeah, just like just like jason in a horror movie or something yes totally you know i've never been I've never been a huge Brainiac fan. At some point on this podcast, I would consider doing a Brainiac through the years episode, but I don't know how interested in that I would be. It's weird for me. There, there are a couple of characters who kind of fall into this category. You know, by and large, I'm again, I'm very proud of uh, coming into comics in the nineties with the death of Superman, but you know, the, the post crisis era. And obviously we spent a lot of time talking about that was, it was it was a period of great creativity and wonderful stories. Um, but I think where 
where the stories maybe stumbled a little bit, you know, had to do with the restrictions placed on them by DC Comics, right? D, you know, Superman had to be the sole survivor of Krypton. So Supergirl, which previously was this very, you know, easy to explain, <laughs> digestible concept of his cousin from Krypton, you know, becomes this protoplasmic being that then merges with a dying human and becomes an earthborn angel. It's like... We're, we're losing the plot a little bit here. Yeah. You know, and not to say that there weren't great stories with that version of the character, but it's like you're bending over backwards to have a Supergirl, right, That's who's not Kryptonian. And at a certain point, and that was sort of one of my takeaways as I was reading those early Triangle era stories is like, Mm -hmm. is is this worth it? I mean, you're, you know, to get to the same result, would it really make that much of a difference? And think about watching, uh, like just, uh, or just describing the other way. And like I said before, to somebody who maybe, uh, just, you know, saw a, a cop book movie for the first time and it's like, Oh, I want to get into Superman. Which one's easier to explain the protoplasmic interdimensional character or oh, it's Superman's cousin. I mean, exactly. it's just, there's something to be said for accessibility, get it out of the way so we can start telling some stories here, you know? Yes. And so, and I think Brainiac kind of falls into that category too, where the version in the nineties, um, he's a, a human, a metahuman, uh, named Milton Fine, a circus performer with psychic powers, uh, who is then possessed by, uh, this, this alien Kaluan consciousness and becomes Brainiac. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Already, <laughs> I hate it. I'll be honest, though. I mean, I grew up reading those stories, and now I've gone back and I've read his introduction, and I kind of do have a soft spot for that iteration of Brainiac. But I guess my overall long-winded point is that it was, I guess, harder to really latch on to Brainiac, just the core concept of Brainiac, because I read a version for a long time who you know, it was a reimagining, right? And then I have since gone mm -hmm. back and I read, you know, his earliest Silver Age introduction, uh, you know, where he's shrinking cities and, and we have the bottle, we introduced the bottle city of Candor and all that stuff. Why would um, a logical being do that though? Like, I mean, maybe I, I should probably read that arc before I say anything. Maybe that'll be my homework. Remind me, carry on. <laughs> you know, to be honest though, it's, I don't think there, there was ever as, as compelling a motivation as what we got in the animated series. And, you know, when I think to, um, you know, other subsequent iterations of Brainiac that maybe I, I was a little bit more uh, into, it was one that took its cue, I think, in large part from the animated series, and that was on Smallville, um, mm -hmm. where there, too, he yep. was created on Krypton. Now, it helped a lot there that it was James Marsters playing him, and I'm a big fan of the actor, so that went a long way. Um, you know, otherwise, the character was more Terminator-esque and the shape-shifting and, and things like that. It wasn't, sure. you, know, it, it, you know, it wasn't directly following the animated series, but in the sense that Brainiac was a Kryptonian creation. So... I think circling back to your point, I think thematically, narratively, in terms of the the character motivations and dynamics and the, you know, putting the characters in such direct opposition like that, that they're both products of Krypton, um, you know, I think really, really does add a lot. And I agree with you. I think the motivation of wanting to collect knowledge and make it more precious by destroying the planet so that he's the only one with that. Also, too, I was thinking if the planet continued, well, then there would be new knowledge and new data that he wouldn't have. So destroying the he planet. He wouldn't have the whole collection. That's right. He wouldn't have That's the right. whole collection. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that was a really, really compelling motivation. And I think that, you know, having him shrink cities and put them in bottles and carry them on the ship is all fine. But I think the animated series really took it to another level by, again, having him then annihilate those planets and still have a collection. But now it's those orbs uh, yeah. that, that uh, you know, from the Stolen Memories uh, episode. Uh, Why all the data? Bringing it back to our earlier conversation about physical media versus digital. <laughs> why would Brainiac collect physical media? That doesn't make any sense based on who he is. He would want everything digital, right? There you go. There you go. There were, you know, it's funny watching, especially these Krypton episodes. There were a few sort of modern day real world things that I was thinking about and I, I wanted to compare notes with you. So speaking of Brainiac uh, in particular, you know, we meet Brainiac in the pilot uh, yeah, in part in yes. part one of the last son of Krypton. Again, he's this Kryptonian artificial intelligence um, who does not support Jor-El's theory about the impending destruction of Krypton. And of course, later we find out <laughs> that he doesn't want to save the planet. And in fact, quite the opposite. He will, he wants it to be destroyed and he will leave with all of uh, all of its data but the way that they rely on brainiac obviously it's um 
you know, far more exaggerated than, than uh, what we see in our world. But I don't know. It doesn't seem that far off from like Alexa or Siri or these other I talk AIs. To my Alexa and my, my Google all day long. It's just a matter of time. You know, it's just a matter of time. Even Jorel has that great line in the pilot where he says people don't like being spied on. Yeah. Right. And uh, yeah, I, I think you make you make a great point. And as this episode goes on as well, too, I think we further uh, further uh, ammunition for my claim here about Brainiac being Superman's truly greatest villain in this show. He's responsible for destroying Krypton. He's responsible for killing Superman's family and his people. And I understand, you know, normally we associate with Lex Luthor, with Superman, but you don't get more than that. And the fact that he has the secrets, so Superman being just arguably wouldn't destroy him anyway, depending on the interpretation, of course, as things are. But him having, no, I, I killed your people. I killed your family. But I'm also the only one who remembers them. So if you want to learn about them, you need to keep me alive. I mean, that's such a devious trap to put somebody in. And um, I really thoroughly enjoyed these Krypton episodes. And it's so cool that we spend so much time there because without commercials, each one of these episodes only clocks in at about on average 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, some are 21, some are 18, about 20 minutes. So we get, you know, a solid 40 minutes, give or take on Krypton. And I love that they spent so much time there. And let's be honest, and you and I have spent a lot of time talking about Superman's origin and about Krypton in general. Saying you've enjoyed your time, a long period of time on Krypton, is not always the case. That's not always necessarily the case. And I think they did such a great job, and I felt like it was essential, even, for the world building that happens after. Yes. And, you know, I, like I I wouldn't have really clocked this as a kid, but watching it now, it's like, pretty bold choice. I mean, we don't yeah. see Superman, you know, we don't see even an adult yeah. Clark until halfway through part two of the three part right? premiere, you know, they devoted the entire first episode solely to Krypton. I mean, that, I think that was a bold choice. I would actually be curious if there was any pushback on that, you know? Um, I mean, I again, w when it originally aired, it was in a block. Um, but you know, of course then later it, it would run, you know, uh, episodically. So you would only see that part one. And I wonder if there was any pushback on that, but I, I think it was a great choice. And I've, you know, I've long said the, the Krypton part of the story traditionally, personally, has been my least favorite part. Mm -hmm. But that's changed a lot. And I think I think the reason I never quite connected with it, I don't know, it probably stems from, I would say, like three things. I'll list them quickly. <laughs> Smallville, right? Which, again, my, my favorite in my heart, right? And that pilot begins with the meteor shower that brings Kal-El to Earth. We don't spend any the time on Krypton. <laughs> We watched that uh, together, uh, quote unquote, for our origin episode. I was so impressed with that pilot episode and how they handled all of that. Yeah, it's phenomenal. So I think the fact that, you know, that one of the tellings that was so formative to me skipped over that entirely. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. you know, right, that was, right. that was part of it because Clark didn't know where he came from. And so even though we as the audience, you know, we know ultimately what his origin is going to turn out to be. It's like we're discovering it with him. It's not like we've had a half hour on Krypton and he doesn't know about it, right? So it, it, right. it totally worked for that. But that, I think, was kind of swirling around in my head. You and I also spent a lot of time talking about the John Byrne version of Krypton post-Crisis yes, on Infinite sure Earths, which was cold and sterile and was was created as, as the complete opposite, a real stark contrast to Earth. And my favorite Krypton artwork, by the way, uh, writing and plot contrivances aside, that art is just so striking. Uh, I find I encourage anybody who hasn't given that a look just to give it a peek. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a lot. And I know for an entire generation of fans, you know, Man of Steel really set the template and the tone for what they think of when they think of, uh, you know, these elements of the mythology. But I guess I never really liked that overly cold and sterile Krypton. I, I mean, I. I think it worked in terms of what Byrne was doing and this era of the character that was really going to be focused far more on, on the human side. But I think that it, it did part of his story a disservice. I feel like what we got certainly in the animated series here where, you know, it's a Krypton where his parents embrace each other and they embrace him. I mean, in, in Burns Man of Steel, you know, Kal-El, is genetic material in a in a matrix and he's uh, he's you ultimately mean, born on earth the, 
<laughs> right, right. My goodness. <laughs> you didn't think the animated series shouldn't have giant Kryptonian battle robots that eventually shrink down and to explain <laughs> the, the invulnerability. And my goodness, I think part of the problem is, yes, it just, it got to be too much. I think we spent too much time on Krypton. It just got to the point where it was like, what are we doing here? Let's get to a Superman story. You know, it just was very, very, um, just a lot of everything. I think that hit the nail on the head because while it was a bold choice, we really do only spend that first 20 minute episode there. I would count the second episode also just because we do see Jor-El and we do get mm. kind of like some more information as well too. And I think that's so important to that story. But in terms of like the runtime of the show, it's a tremendous amount of time we spend on Krypton. But in, the t in terms of viewing, it's a quick 20 minutes, half hour at the time with commercials. And if they were all airing in that kind of block, like you were saying, that's I, I'd be actually curious to say. I mean, was wondering if if they did have any pushback from the network, from uh, Warner Brothers, even from DC uh, editorial. I wonder if part of that was, hey, they're all going to be in a block together. We're going to get there. We're going to get there all at the same time, quote unquote, as they air essentially. Yeah, and, but I, I mean, it totally works. I think, and then the other reason why I don't think I ever totally connected with Krypton, uh, you know. And, People will likely disagree. You know, going back to Superman, the movie, and and that in, incarnation of Krypton, you know, uh, Marlon Brando, legendary actor. Uh, of course. You know, that, that whole movie is iconic, but that that incarnation of Krypton never really did much for me. Now, once we got to Smallville and we settled in on the farm with the Kents, that's where that movie, like, really came alive for me. And uh, shout out to Man of Steel as well, too. I thought Man of Steel had some awesome, which you actually, a lot of similarities between this Jor-El and uh, Russell Crowe over in uh, in Man of Steel, which I was excited to mention to you too, which I thought was kind of cool to see and put that together. And that's where, you know, I think in recent years, I've now had a bit of a flip where I've now really come around to the Krypton part of the story. And I think I can point to three things really quickly. Man of Steel, Superman the Animated Series, and Superman Birthright. You know, those were three stories where we spent time with with a version of Krypton and with a version of Jor-El and Lara where I really felt invested and I felt for them as parents. And, it, you know, it, it did also accomplish a lot of world building and especially with Superman the Animated Series, knowing the episodes that we're going to get um, with Brainiac, with the Phantom Zone criminals. It really, it really does a lot to establish that world. So now we all have a frame of reference for that. Um, so I, so I think that, again, I really think it was a great choice and, you know, it shows, you know, it shows where he comes from and what his, his birth parents went through to get him here. And the, the, the one main similarity with Man of Steel that I love is there's always, there always has to be a sense of urgency, right? To get Kal-El off of Krypton. That's always mm -hmm. going to be there. But I like when Jor-El has an added layer of a battle and a chase, Yep. And we get that in both of these here. And I like that. I, it, it, again, I science think it just, adventurer. Science he's, he's a sci yeah. You know, he's both of these things. And that also explains to me who Clark is inherently yes. so much more. It makes so much more sense from that lens. Yes, exactly. And, you know, um, I said this to you off mic, but I've already recorded the first episode that will air after our five part event here. And it's a look at the first season of Superman and Lois and Ken Marion is, is back as my guest for that. And, you know, one of the things that people will hear when, when that episode airs, you know, Ken asks, he's like, you know, why? Because we were talking about the Jor-El in Superman and Lois. And we're like, why is Jor-El always so old? Yeah. In these. And I was like, you know, that's a really good question. And I and we, I guess, we would be Jor-El's age. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. And I, we, I might have some grays creeping in, but I'm not like Brando old with all due respect to, to that time coming in. I mean, right. That's it. And I said to him, I was like, you know, the, the main exception to that, that I can think of is Superman, the animated series. And so that's another thing that yeah. I like. It's like, yeah, no, that is about the age that he would be. And I, I like, and right. you know, Russell Crowe is older than like, you know, like what we get in Superman, the animated series, but it's sure. still not, not quite as old. So I think that kind of was somewhere in between. We, but, got some, we got some action out of him, you know, which was fun. Exactly. But yeah, like this iteration of Jor-El, like, this felt very on point. I like, I really, I like that a yeah. lot. Me too. I was a, a, a huge fan. And you know, thanks to uh, the incredible deep dive we did about Superman's uh, origins, um, as soon as I see an origin story of Superman, I have to start just being like, well, what's different? Uh, mm -hmm. Parents are younger. 
that you already uh, hit on. What I thought was kind of interesting as well, too, is that we actually don't see Clark as an infant here, but as a toddler, since you and I are both parents, we kind of tell you at that stage with him walking around and kind of babbling, talking here and there. So a little bit older, even traditionally, that doesn't really matter for anything. I just thought it was a fun observation. And also that his rocket ship doesn't crash in this show, which I thought was interesting. It lands. Something I don't know. I'd have to go and look back, but most of the time I feel like it crashes. This time it lands nicely. I thought that was an interesting distinction from this. Yes. The, you know, the toddler aspect I did want to ask you about because it really, it pulled at my heartstrings even more. Oh, I yeah. mean, because yes. it's like, I, I don't want to say, oh, it's easier to put an infant into a rocket, but it's like we have now very recently, both of us and our own families, gone through this process of watching an infant become a toddler. And it's like, Again, the Kal-El we see in the pilot, like you said, I mean, he's playing with the dog and saying dada and, and you know, yeah. uh, hugging. It's like there's more of a connection that has now been formed. Like the, he has more personalities, more developed. Which, more stakes. It's, it's more heartbreaking, quite frankly. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I think that's really what it comes down to. You know, that, that toddler has an understanding of what's happening. Uh, to some degree. And just, it, it's, it's such a, uh, especially as a parent, just a deep pang of sadness and fear that you could, it's just enhanced, I think, by, by having uh Kalala at that age. Yes. And I'm with you on the rocket. It's, it's funny because I can't think of, and I've now gone through virtually all of the, the, the talents yes. of the origin <laughs> and yeah. And I think virtually every other one, there's a crash landing. Yeah. And this one, it just, and you know, uh, I'm split. Ultimately, you know, if when I'm building my own in, in my head, like what I consider the definitive origin, that rocket comes in hot. It comes in hot sure. and it crashes. It's, a, it's an emergency. Yes. It's, you know, it was under duress. It shot out, you know. But at the same time, it's like, well, Jorel is this brilliant scientist. He's calculated yeah. the route. It's like. I was I was just thinking that. I was like, I like it in that sense because it's like, yeah, Jorel's the man. Like he knew. Even under duress, like he had that. He kept his he kept his son safe until the very moment he touched the ground and he landed there. And I think there's a sense of beauty in that as well. Yes. No, I do like that. And I mean, not to. And also, maybe this is a little nitpicky, but. It also helps account for how this might conceivably happen without other people knowing, you know, if it just kind of gently lands. Excellent, Excellent point. You know, there's there's that as well. And then, of course, you know, they would use the ship as the series went on, right? And he would have his space suit and he would be flying out in space in it. So they, you know, I think that probably was the ultimate reason why they did that because they knew they were going to yeah. be using it moving forward. So. Jonathan Kent slayed me with one of my favorite lines when he says, oh, maybe it's the Russians. <laughs> with, that, with that rocket coming down that tickled me i was like what a what a perfectly almost folksy of a certain era thing to say you know yeah yeah no a hundred percent um you know going back to krypton i love the i love the visuals i love the aesthetic of krypton uh yeah. again it definitely harkened back more to the silver age um but more importantly i was just glad that they didn't go with the ice motif um, you know, it's fine. It's, I don't have yeah. anything against it, but I don't think that every iteration of Krypton needs to follow it. Right. And it, well, I, a part of me is like, you know, do they, it's like a chicken and the egg thing. Right. And you, you would obviously have the answer to this if there is an answer to this, but I wonder like, does that inform the fortress of solitude or did the fortress of solitude inform later reimaginings of Krypton? So there's that, like, uh, he's from an ice themed world ish to his Fortress of Solitude where he's trying to honor and remember and learn about Krypton have that same motif. Yeah, that's, I think that's fair. I think that's a fair point. Um, but but I, also, I like, you know, why ice? I don't, you know, that's, that's the other thing too. <laughs> yeah. The, or the crystals. Yeah. I mean, but right, I, sure, I, I'm saying ice, it's crystals, but it looks like ice essentially. Yeah. Yes. Um, but as so I was glad that they went with a different aesthetic um, and, and as far as, you know, jor whole quest, I mean, this is, consistent across tellings uh right regardless of exactly why krypton is dying uh, although the unstable core that's that's i think pretty um mm -hmm. has pretty much cemented itself now as as the reason um but you know and he's not believed and it, talking about real world <laughs> parallels have you seen the the movie and i'm gonna now date our recording um but it because it just came out uh, on christmas eve but don't look up on netflix have you seen it no but i want to slash 
I'm also scared too because I'm worried that it's a documentary in disguise. <laughs> <laughs> so for anyone not familiar, uh, a new work by the very liberal filmmaker Adam McKay, and he might have a number of people who would never watch this movie but for that reason alone. Great, but, great cast. It looks like though, phenomenal cast on great, board. Great cast. Uh, you know, the, he also did the uh, the Big Short and Vice, uh, but this new movie, uh, Don't Look Up, uh, is about astronomers who discover a comet that is uh, hurtling towards Earth on a collision course with Earth will destroy the planet, and they have an exceedingly challenging time convincing people to take it seriously. So yes, it is very much a metaphor for both climate change as well as COVID. This idea that even when faced with hard data, uh, people don't want to deal with these inconvenient truths, right? That's the thrust of, of the movie here. Be like Jorel, everybody. And that's Be like the, Jorel. That's the message that I would like to convey. And that's the thing. And without even, I don't think, getting too political, this is the other reason why the Krypton part of the story works for me now in a way that it didn't before. Because I think when I was younger, and I don't know that I even would have necessarily articulated it in this way, but I think even in the back of my mind, a part of me was probably like, I don't get it. Like he has this information that the planet is dying. Like why wouldn't they believe him? Like I don't know that I fully bought that tension, it, right? Now, well, to be fair, the rest of the Kryptonians read a bunch of social media posts. So they were, you know, they also <laughs> thought they were experts on it, you know? But, yeah, they did their own research and they knew. There you go. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but that's the thing. You know, like now, after everything we've lived through, see, if there's any upside to these global calamities that we've been experiencing, it's that I can appreciate a facet of the Superman origin story in a way that I didn't before. Because now it's like, oh, yeah. I 1,000% buy that the Science Council and anyone else who heard jor theory wouldn't believe him. So I think that's, mm -hmm. the other, that's the other piece that has kind of really turned me around on, on the Krypton part of the story. And it's like, no, like, this is exceedingly believable, sadly. Um, so that was something that, you know, and especially watching it now, totally. Yeah, no, and that's, uh, you're right. Unfortunately, we have that lens and frame of reference where uh, that's a theme and motif I hope future generations aren't still relating to, but it is uh, immeasurably important and relatable. It's a cautionary tale that we still haven't learned yet. One thing that <laughs> sort of made me laugh was, um, you know, we they, they use uh, Lara's father uh, a fair amount in, in that first episode, and he's on the Science Council, right? And there's this, I, I think they did a nice job of depicting what would be very believable tension between jor and Lara, Right. Like, she, you know, she supports him, but, you know, they're being ostracized and, and, and ridiculed, right, by the, the larger society over over these theories. Um, and, you know, the council in particular, they are deferring to Brainiac, who, as we know, is lying. Right. He's saying that, no, mm -hmm. the data doesn't add up. Krypton's fine. But then <laughs> there's a certain point where uh, Lara's father is like, oh, like, I read your report. I think you're right. And I said to myself, like. This council didn't even read the friggin' thing. Like, <laughs> nope. And I, again, that's part of what you're saying. That's completely believable, right? Yeah. They just they didn't. Oh, Brainiac's got it. We're good. No, no worries. Because apparently, merely reading this report would be enough to change someone's mind. So it yeah, was. She didn't read it for that long, right? No. <laughs> she just kind of gave it a quick look over and was like, "Oh no, we're gonna die." So yeah, maybe just take a couple seconds and glance, peruse, if you will. Yeah. So, uh, but, but anyway, I, I enjoyed, you know, we spent a lot of time on Krypton, um, but I really, I enjoyed the way that that portion of the story was told and the time that was afforded to that part of it. And, you know, we mentioned the not crash landing, but the very gentle landing, um, in Smallville. And, you know, we, we spend, uh, you know, a little bit of time with Clark in Smallville as an adolescent, as his powers are emerging, he's, um, confiding in Lana. He, you know, he saves this, uh, family from an explosion. Um, and then we get, you know, the big reveal, right? Where Jonathan and Martha show him the rocket. I want to say one of the things that I really liked about this version of the origin story was how I feel like in, in a lot of tellings, Jorel has a lot to do. <laughs> Jonathan has a lot to do. Laura and Martha often get the short end of the stick, but I liked how in both cases, both parents, both units were, you know, were, were in the mix. And, you know, when, when Clark 
sees that recording. It's not just a recording of Jorel. It's both of his birth parents. And mm -hmm. it's not just Jonathan taking him into that barn and showing him the rocket. It's Jonathan and Martha. I really, really like that. Why, why wouldn't it be? Right? That makes yeah. perfect sense. It makes perfect uh, logical logical sense. And uh, I agree. I think when we, we looked um, at all of those different uh, origins and you know different kind of uh, perspective and lenses, I think we both favor the ones where they do have uh, crucial, crucial roles to play in informing Clark's as equals, you know, a hundred percent in informing um, Clark's journey, uh, Kal El to Clark's journey, I should say. Yeah. And, you know, then it's, it's absolutely, you know, soaring when, you know, he, you know, he runs off, but then he, you know, uh, uh, unlocks his ability to fly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's this, you know, really triumphant moment and he's able to attain some measure of, of peace about it. One of the things we did talk about when we did our larger discussion on the origins is that, and I think we were, we were on the same page with this. You know, I, I tend to like when he has to work a little bit harder to get the information about where he comes from. I mean, here he gets it all mm -hmm. in a very convenient info dump but that's okay yeah. and it's an animated series and i you know that's fine um i, I was i Time was okay with right yeah i thought it worked it worked fine but while we're while we're dealing with the smallville clark um do you mind if we jump to one of the final episodes in this in this mixtape the new kids in town because that's let's, an episode let's do it I'm, I'm excited to talk to you about that because man i know what a big legion fan you are and you're gonna be <laughs> And I've been eagerly looking forward to talking to you about this. And it's your favorite thing when they come in and Smallville, when he, you know, and when he's still young. So I say tongue in cheek for those of you who may not be familiar. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. I love I love the idea. If only they had put him in a Superboy costume and had him flying around, traveling okay. to the you know future, I mean? having needs all these Metropolis? adventures. Let's uh, just cut Metropolis out of the equation and just, you know, do yeah. it all there in Smallville. Yep, 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 yep. Good times. Good times. Yes. So as I have gone on record as saying, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of Clark as Superboy. I'm not a fan of Clark having adventures with the Legion in the future. Um, I get why, you know, especially if you grew up reading those stories, why you might have some attachment, why that would seem cool. Um, if for me, I just always felt like it. And I guess because his journey is so important to me as a fan of the character, like that journey to figure out where he comes from and what his role is going to be. I just feel like it undermines it if he's given all of these answers and he has all of these adventures beforehand. But anyway, so going into this episode, yeah, I mean, it was a little a little dicey. And this was the one that I talked about on that Superman the Animated podcast. Mm -hmm. So I am now- as well. Yeah, it was, <laughs> but you know, here's the, like, here's the crazy thing. And I, I, I'm like so torn on this because I love Smallville. And I love the Smallville yep. portion of the story, not so much the Legion. So this one, like I was all over the place. <laughs> and here, here's the thing. Here's what I've come to settle. And I, again, I kind of, I kind of have the same experience with the Legion as I do with the new gods. I don't have nearly as much depth or experience comic wise with the Legion as I probably should. I've most, just like the new gods, and we'll talk about that at a later date. I've mostly read the Legion when they've been involved in a crisis or a crossover or kind of a bigger event. I agree with what you're saying fundamentally, like without a shadow of a doubt, you need to not touch Clark's origin in Smallville because I think when you do that, you do ruin some of his journey and his mystique. And when he gets to Metropolis and becomes Superman, it feels earned. I don't think it feels earned if he's been zipping around a Superboy in Kansas. I do, however, really love the idea of the Legion which is where I, I had an interesting conflict. I love the idea that centuries from now, that there is an entire superhero force who's been inspired by Superman. That is a great idea. And I think I would appreciate, at least for me, which is my inconsequential opinion, you know, no, no better or worse than anybody else. I would like to see the reverse happen to what happened in this episode. Instead of the Legion coming back in time, and seeing, you know, I would rather see Superman as maybe even adult go forward in time and kind of, you know, further on his journey and say, oh my goodness, like what I'm doing is important. It does matter. You know, it kind of, uh, how we like our Superman conflicted. That to me is like a super cool kind of boost for him, for maybe a conflicted Superman to be like, no, like what I did here mattered. It still matters. And I think that would be cool and just leave 
his origin and his journey alone. That's how I would reconcile that because I do think it's a super cool idea. The characters are, are interesting. They're definitely, I'm not going to lie to you. They're not a list heavy hitters. Don't get me wrong, but I think they're all interesting with some unique, cool powers. They're interesting enough where I would love to see more of them. I would love to read more about them, but I, I do agree fundamentally with you really, you ruin something from a storytelling perspective. I think when you, when you stick them in to Smallville, yeah, I mean, I, the thing is, I, I don't. I, I think for the most part, I'm with you. Like, I don't, I don't object to the concept of the Legion of Superheroes, and I, I, I do agree. I mean, I actually think it's, it's quite beautiful. This idea that he, you know, centuries from now, inspires this group and is able to demonstrate that you know people from different worlds can work together. That's great. It, That's it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, you know, it's really again him having those adventures with the Legion before he becomes Superman, where it's just a bridge too far for me. That's, that's kind of where I, I hit the wall. Now, what they did here is, so the basic premise for anyone who, who needs a refresher is uh, Brainiac, our old pal Brainiac is up to it again. Oh, um, okay. In the future, he is able to transport himself uh, back into the past to uh, Clark's adolescence in Smallville. Three member to kill him before he can become Superman. And also, three members. Means Superman, Superman never stopped Brainiac. Which I also think True. is a very cool message as well, too. Carry on. Just want to throw cool. that in there. Yeah. Oh, time travel hijinks. Uh, and mm -hmm. so three members of the Legion of Superheroes, Cosmic Boy, Chameleon, and and um, uh, uh, Saturn Girl travel back in time to yep. stop him. And so what we get there is actually, again, another uh, sort of another parallel with Smallville because Smallville did almost the same, virtually the same thing um, in a season eight episode where... Uh, three members of the Legion <laughs> come back in time. And I don't, uh, I don't want to take us too far afield with this, but it, like, I like the way Smallville handled it. The way Smallville did it was um, they hinted at Clark's future without showing or telling him too much, such that he, I think, was able to, you know, take one teeny tiny baby step closer to his final destiny without needing to be mind wiped. And that was, see, that was the thing with this episode where, you know, young Clark has this adventure with the, the members of the Legion. They ultimately stop Brainiac. A lot of Smallville is, is totaled, um, but Saturn girl. Yeah, those, those poor football players. I mean, I know they were jerks and bullies, but boy, they got a walloping in this episode. I right? want to circle back to that. I want to circle back okay, to them. Good. Uh, but, and Saturn girl is able to, uh, you know, tamper with everyone's mind and and make them forget Brainiac, make them think it was a tornado. Huge ethical problem. Huge ethical problem. Yes. And right. And she does it with Clark as well. And um, you know, over the course of the episode, we, you know, we see a Clark whose powers have started to emerge, but who doesn't yet know where he comes from. And he's gotten a bit arrogant. And I want to circle back to the 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 basketball scene and all that stuff. But he's gotten a bit arrogant, right? And he learns humility over the course of this adventure with the Legion and fighting Brainiac. And he sees what he will look like as Superman in the future. And he learns about everything he's going to inspire. And then, you know, that is a race. And I just feel like, well, then what the hell was the point of all of this? <laughs> there, there, there was none. <laughs> Really? I mean, I agree completely. You're, you're absolutely right. It's, I think you're right. I think you kind of, you kind of hit the compromise right where it needs to be is if they show up and give him a nudge without telling him too much. And like, we know that's a great wink and a nod. And you're right. Maybe that is something that kind of gives him another little half step to who he's going to be. Maybe that's important to happen. Maybe that always has happened. In every timeline, for all we know, it's one of those things. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. But yeah, I mean, if you're just going to do something and hit the do sex machina button and just like you know, just you know, the MacGuffins here, let's just hit the reset button. It never happened. Why? Why? Why do we? Why do we care necessarily? We got to see some new people from the future. That's cool. But there, it sticks out too, especially in this series with these creators that do such a good job of like this long form storytelling. Where you know, and the things we see in the pilot keep paying off you know episodes and seasons down the line as well so it's um it, I, I agree with you just mind wiping everybody is a you know it just kind of feels like well what did we do here what was the point point? and also like i said that is wildly unethical and probably not how a superhero should be behaving right <laughs> yeah but i will give them credit again you know just like the pilot you know this was a full episode with no superman you know we really spent yeah. time with and and um 
uh, Jason Marsden, who voiced him in in the in the in part two of the Last Son of Krypton, uh, you know, is back. So that was really cool. Yeah, let's talk about Kenny Braverman and these other uh, Smallville jocks. You know, we see Clark's arrogance there, at the at the dance, right, where Kenny so, uh, challenges. Yeah, him. so you, you you brought something up, and actually, it's so funny. So I said they were football players because in every single origin story, <laughs> you need. Goodness gracious, have we covered a lot of origins for Superman <laughs> and Clark here. And almost every single one is football, but you're 100% right. This was basketball, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder uh, why why that was. That, that's, that's so interesting to me. I feel like it was probably because that was most conducive to what Kenny could challenge Clark to in the middle of a dance. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, because right, they're in the gymnasium. The were there. Okay. That makes sense. You're right. It was built in because they were in the gym. Yeah. Now, Jeremy. Has, had that, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, has has anyone ever threatened to burn your butt? And if so, how did you handle that? Well, I know people pay good money for that kind of thing. Certain kind of people. <laughs> so it depends, I guess, on who you're asking, right? It could be a threat. It could be a proposition. <laughs> it could be an act of love. I don't know. We're not here to judge people on digging for kryptonite. But no, nobody has ever threatened to burn my butt. I don't even know what that would entail. Are they going to use a match? Do they have a flamethrower? Are they going to drag my butt? Like, what, what's going to happen to my butt? I don't know. This has been the My Butt Podcast. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you next week. My favorite, yeah. my favorite part, right? Because Kenny comes up, he's like, "I'll burn your butt," whatever he says. But my favorite part is that Clark repeats it to Lana. You're gonna burn. He's going to burn my butt. Yeah, where Lana's like, Clark, what are you doing? He's like, he said he's going to burn my butt. As if like this, <laughs> it's like this, this has to be answered. <laughs> you can say what you want about my mother, but if you ever threaten my butt again, <laughs> you don't know what my butt's been through. It was, yeah, that was, that just made me laugh. But, you know, uh, speaking of Kenny, and I'm going to go back to what you had said before, Kenny Braverman. Now, side note, um, are you familiar with Kenny Braverman from the comics at all? Nope, not at all. Not so at all. In the 90s, and I'm going to be talking about this towards the end of this year on the podcast, uh, because he has a significant arc in the death of Clark Kent storyline, uh, where he becomes the villain Conduit. And I maintain that Conduit is one of the great untapped villains. This is a super electric Superman thing, isn't it? With a name like Conduit, right? No, it's, it's actually... Believe it's it or not. not. No, it actually predates. He has kryptonite powers, but it predates uh, Electric Superman by a few years. But I feel I like that. in both the comics and adaptations, there's so much untapped potential here. Uh, just like I feel about Steel. There's so oh, there's a lot of good stuff out there. Anyway, Steel, Steel I love. Uh, but anyway, so we so we get this Kenny Braverman here. Kenny Braverman takes such a beating in this episode. You know, Clark flings him across the auditorium. He hurts his arm a little, but whatever. But then later in the episode, he and his buddies are at the diner and Brainiac comes in. Brainiac throws him through the through the window of the diner and then throws him through the roadside sign of this kid would be dead. I, so my, my, I think I said out loud to nobody. I was just like, he's dead. Brainiac's just out here just canceling people left, right, and center. Like, that was it. You know? Get the yellow tape out. Like, there's no way he would have survived that. I mean, cartoon laws, I guess. But, you know, still, like, it's, yeah. I mean, it was brutal. But that also, like, informs, like, just how scary Brainiac is also too, right? Like it's, he just doesn't care. You know, he's just out here just uh, nothing but the objective. Everything else is incidental collateral damage, you know? Yeah, no, very much so. Uh, I, I, a couple of other notable things. Melissa Joan Hart voiced Saturn Girl, uh, which I had so I didn't good. recognize initially and I, and I looked at the credits. Well, that's why she mind wiped everybody at the end of the episode because she couldn't explain it all. There you go. I thought you were going to make a witch. That's it for me, folks. I'm not going to do better than that. I'm out of here. <laughs> I thought we were going with a witchcraft. I thought we were going Sabrina territory, but you want Clarissa, and I appreciate that. I got only two choices with that, man. They got two, two, two strong choices, you know? Uh, so, you know, there was that. And then, you know, one of my favorite bits was the Kents in that episode when, yep. you know, they're in the, in the cellar and then, you know, Jonathan grabs the shovel to go help Clark and Martha's like, no, what are you doing? Oh. And, you know, you assume she's going to be like, oh, it's too dangerous. But she's like, no, you need something stronger. And she gives him a rifle ah, I, or shotgun. Oh, it was great. Jonathan Kent <laughs> is strapped. He keeps that thing on him, as the kids say today. And um, yeah, first of all, I was like, oh yeah, I guess that makes sense. They would just have a weapon uh, in like, you know, rural Kansas, like at the time, like I get that. But I was just like, A, it's still weird seeing that kind of weapon in like an animated show, especially like at that time, that 
probably wouldn't fly now, depending on like what the target audience was or not. I don't know necessarily, but <laughs> Jonathan Kent is maybe in many ways, just the greatest uh, Superman supporting cast member. And you and I have talked about Outland, especially as fathers now ourselves, how much we just love and admire that character and just the bravery that's on display here. Like Jonathan Kent is an older man. He's got no powers. He's he's he understands that his son, who even does have obviously exceptional ability, is out there and is out man, and all of this horror is happening outside, and he doesn't bat an eyelash to arm himself, facing what is most likely certain death, to even have the smallest chance to help his son. And how could you not absolutely love and admire a character like that? I mean, uh, Jonathan Kent is just fantastic. And even though he is definitely a, an older portrayal here, uh, a kind of like Jor-El and um, uh, Lara as well too, we see different ages, you know, kind of for both sets of, of his parents as well. Here they're portrayed as older, but I still think they completely nailed his character, even just based on that one scene alone, just the love and bravery he's showing for his son. So first, a million times, yes. Second, Martha, too, gets in on the action, which, once yep. again, I love. Like, that's the thing. I, you know, uh, and I think and in the Superman and Lois episode that people will hear in a few weeks, we talk about this. But, you know, a lot of that show is, you know, there's not a, and there's not a ton of Pa Kent in Superman and Lois in flashback yeah. or, you know, or in terms of, like, what's motivating him. A lot of it falls more to Martha, and I think that's great. It's like, you know, you, you utilize these characters. Uh, so there was that. And then just going back to what I was saying at the beginning about this, uh, you know, the ways in which this show, I think, really distills to me the best elements of the character. Um, you know, it takes its cue from post-crisis mythology where the Kents are alive. And, you know, Ma and Pa in, in most of the, the episodes, like this was an episode where they were featured pretty prominently, you know, don't always get a ton of other play, but, you know, sometimes it might just be a scene where, you know, Clark is back at the farm getting that that piece of advice. And yep. scenes like that, for me, go a long way, especially when, you know, we're dealing with a, a, a Superman who has no other confidants, you know, who really know him uh, in that way. So, yeah, I, I really, I, I love all we of that so much. We talked about that um, twice before, both uh, talking yep. about our origins and even more specifically in the beautiful, also, if I had to choose a comic as an entry point, our Superman for all seasons talk as well, too, just about how we think it's, um, how we prefer, you know, every interpretation is valid, how we prefer when the Kents are alive, because uh, it's just, it is, I mean, again, you said it perfectly, it's Superman is so alone, especially early on in his career as, you know, Superman he has that confidence that he can still zip home to for advice and a talk and a, it keeps him grounded, um, which I think is just so crucial and, and so important for the character as well. And uh, it's funny, we've said this before too, but we've said in other podcasts just how much more appreciative and drawn to uh, Pa Kent now, considering we're both fathers uh, ever uh, before in our lives. It's, uh, it gives you a new perspective on, uh, on everything they, that both of them went through which I think is a, is a beautiful, a beautiful thing. It works on different levels. And what's cool is that as we get older, we appreciate characters and see them through lenses. And I talk about being timeless, right? We get to see through our own experiences, how we can relate as we change to these other characters as well. And that's why I, I can't say enough good things about Superman's supporting cast. Well said. And, and I, I was thinking about that too, um, going back to the the pilot and, you know, again, the time we spend with jor and Laura and Jonathan and Martha, and, you know, I've, I've used this analogy before, but it's like, you know, jor throws this Hail Mary pass across the universe, right? Mm -hmm. And and jor and Laura both throw it, and the Kents catch it. And it's like, you know, and like you said, as a, as a parent now, from both, I guess, like from both perspectives, you know, the, the birth parents who, you know, it's like, you know, your, your heart just breaks for them but at the same time it's like you you totally get it right like as as hard and as scary as that would be to to send him out in that lifeboat across the stars it's like it's a chance it's a chance at life and to borrow a line from man of steel it's like at least you know like he'll be a god to them uh when, when he lands you know because you would be so scared um and then you know from the perspective of of the kent it, it's like to you know of course they have the added layer of being thrust instantly into parenthood <laughs> but, but you know just yeah. the idea of now becoming a parent and you know this is something I was, i've been reflecting on recently where it's like 
you know, I was thinking about like life changes and how, um, you know, becoming a, a dad like is probably the the biggest change, but also in in the shortest amount of time, because as much as you have those nine months and you're preparing for it, it it's still not, you know, there's nothing like that moment when then you're actually holding your child and it's like, oh, OK, <laughs> like, this is over. I got to figure this out now. Like, yep. You know, like everything, because I was thinking about this, you know, everything else, it's like, like with my wife, it's like, you know, we started dating, right? And, you know, go out maybe, you know, once or twice a week, and then you spend more time together. And, you know, like for us, like we moved in together before we got married. Um, and even before same, we, same. and even before we moved in, it's like, we were spending most nights together anyway. And we were just kind of like right. alternating places, you know? So even moving in wasn't like that big of a deal, really. Um, and then getting married too, it's like, it was, it was wonderful and it was a great time, but it wasn't like, oh, okay, now I'm more committed. It's like, we were already committed to each other. We were already living together. Yeah. yeah. But that moment where they handed me our son, I was like, okay, <laughs> it's like, it's a big it's, thing. It's so interesting to me, right? And I know we're, <laughs> we're getting into the weeds and off topic here a little bit, but uh, so I've been living, I'm from New York, obviously same area as you for most of my life. And I've lived down here outside of Charleston for the past four years. And now my family, as of uh, two weeks from now, will be moving back to New York, which is also super fun. Again, more inside baseball, which tickles me is that over the run of these episodes, you will see <laughs> me here in South Carolina. And then it will also end with me in New York, taking a little journey of my own that is also informed with what we're doing is for our child to kind of tie that whole theme. You know, we're getting a better opportunity. We're going to be with our friends and family and support system uh, again as well too. And it's so funny because there are so many people who have never met my daughter just because she was born shortly before the pandemic hit. And the person I am now is definitely a much different person than when I left. Yeah. And I, again, I can think of no, no better, just, you know, off the top of my head connection of why these themes are timeless and why they are universal because they speak to us and they become more relevant as we grow older. Yeah. Well said. Uh, all right. Bringing this back to the world of, of the animated We're series. back. We're back. Uh, so, you know, we were, this of course, new kids, uh, I guess I new kids on the block new kids in town. <laughs> New kids on the block had a bunch of hits. Chinese food makes me sick. That was actually LFO, but it still counts. <laughs> uh, you know, going back to another Brainiac episode, uh, you know, we we already, we did touch on stolen memories and, and the orbs and, and we can circle back. I'm happy to circle back to that, but I just wanted to touch on Ghost in the Machine for a minute, which is um, yes. Brainiac's reappearance after stolen memories, uh, where it turns out he's been uh, hiding in the, the Luther Corp mainframe and he... Uh, basically abducts Lex and forces him to uh, finish work on Brainiac's new body. Poor, poor Lex in that, man. He really got put through the ringer. You know what's so funny was that, uh, well, two things. First, you know, I, so I carved up these mixtapes, you know, which episodes were going to which mixtape before I rewatched them, you know, and I was relying on my memory and, you know, just reading episode descriptions. Mm -hmm. You know, Ghost in the Machine probably could and should have been in the Lex supporting cast mixtape. I think that sure, really fits sure. better there. Um, but at the same time, this kept it a little bit more even, so we'll go with it. And Brainiac's, you know, Brainiac's a major player in it. Yeah, it's, it's a, a thematically still there. Uh, but anyway, so that's why it's in, in this episode. Um, but uh, it just <laughs> made me laugh because, you know, there's a point where Lex is like, I'm human, I need to eat and rest. And, uh, you know, Brainiac smashes open the vending machine and gets the candy, candy bars. bars. And, yeah. you know, Lex is just ripping open those candy bars. And I was saying to myself, how long has it been? But I guess it was, in fairness, I think it had been maybe at least a few days. Yeah, he had the five o'clock shadow. It also made me laugh because it's like they couldn't show any other hair growth. So, like, he, cause he's bald. <laughs> so they had to have the five o'clock shadow come in, right? Hmm. I wanted to... Um, it's just a quick tiny tangent. When you mentioned about the shotgun and you were like, oh, would they be able to show something like that today? In one of our upcoming episodes, we're we're going to be talking about one of my favorite episodes from the entire series, the late Mister Kent. Mm -hmm. And we see not one but two executions in that, or you know, one of uh, well, we'll we'll get into sure. that, but two two execute. And I was watching, and I'm like, oh, you would never see this now in a cartoon. But like, it's also crazy to me too, because like. I remember distinctly like Spider-Man, the animated series that was on around ish the same time, maybe just like a year or two before, like they could only fire like lasers yeah. in that show. So I really just, 
I don't know what it is that got him to, to sneak sneak past the goalie on that one, but my goodness, they were just they were going for it. Yeah, but anyway, so the Ghost in the Machine episode, um, you know, historically, right, we've had the Luther Brainiac team. So you know, anytime yeah. I think those characters are are in an episode together, whether they're aligned or in opposition as they are here, I think is always interesting, um, especially this iteration of Lex, who I love so much. And we'll talk about more when, when we when we do that. that next day. So good. Fun um, fact, not to yeah. get us too off topics again, just real quick, because I know you're a big Lost fan as well, too. Did you remember Clancy Brown has a bit of a cameo in yes. Lost? Yeah. With Desmond, right, as one of the Dharma. Yeah, I just thought about that the other day, and it tickled me to see him pop up in something else we both love. So kind of a fun connection there as well, too. Yes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, and so, you know, I enjoyed I enjoyed the episode for that. And at some point in the future, Jeremy, I will likely call upon you again to do a similar run of episodes uh, on Justice League and Justice League Unlimited. That's probably like, probably like in the that's in the future. Music but, to my ears. Let's go, but, man. Let's get it. And I'm going to say this as if I remembered and as if I didn't have to rely on Wikipedia for the reminder. But did you know <laughs> that uh, Justice League Unlimited um, plays on the Ghost in the Machine episode in particular? Do you remember the connection point? I don't. Not off the top of my head, no. So in Ghost in the Machine, uh, towards the end, uh, Brainiac zaps Lex. And we find out in that Justice League Unlimited episode years later that he like implanted himself within Lex and that allows him to take control of him for a certain period of time. Yeah. It's just long-term storytelling. This is what we're talking about. That's unbelievable. That's yeah. awesome. But the most interesting thing to me about Ghost in the Machine, and I had, I mean, this was something I completely forgot. You know, a lot of the episode has to deal with Mercy. You know, Lex is, mm-hmm. is Lex's she gets bodyguard. A, the spotlight, I would even argue in this episode, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Superman questions her about like why, you know, why you're so loyal. I mean, and she is exceedingly loyal to Lex and clear, clearly has deep affection. And she talks about how she was living on the streets like a stray yeah. and he took her yes. in, he gave her purpose. And, you know, there's that critical moment towards the end of the episode where, you know, the, the building is collapsing and Mercy is pinned and Lex sees her, stops for a second, turns and leaves. And Superman, of course, rescues, rescues her. And then at the end of the episode, we see her back back to duty as, as Lex's chauffeur and bodyguard. And I don't know, what was, what was your take on, on what? Cause I, again, I was, I had completely forgotten all of that. I thought it was really interesting. Hashtag free mercy. You know, uh, it's, it's heartbreaking and they did such a good job of taking, and this is going to sound silly in an episode with ghost of the machine and everything else and all the, the high concept sci-fi and everything else we have going on, but they did such a good job with mercy's story in this episode of taking the realistic arc, unfortunately, where somebody feels so loyal to something that the other person did or quote unquote saving their life that forever they are indebted to that person. And it does such a great job because even with those lines, I think it's the last line of the episode, right? When Superman turns to her and just goes, oh, it's just like a, just a, a kid from the streets, right? Where he even just is kind of just like, repeating it and in that line this that line that last line could be taken like so many different ways which i think is great as well too he's reflecting on the whole situation and you can almost hear like the disappointment as well as like maybe even a tinge of surprise in his voice tim daly is just he's the best i still when i read just like with mark hamill uh as the joker when i read comic books that's the voice i hear tim daly's voice is in my head when i read superman comics uh, i'm sure i'm not alone <laughs> or special in that regard i'm sure many of us owe him that thanks so um but that that really i thought that line was so powerful at the end of that episode because it's sad and it just makes us despise lex even more like you said turning his back on him but at the same time i think we can all also understand that that's a very real understandable feeling and clutch and emotional dependency that is is all too real and prevalent in, in in our real world as well and that's what makes it such a poignant and sad episode and the fact that they were able to tell that story in about 20 minutes within an episode where we have Lex Luthor being the the you know essential uh, forced worker for Brainiac creating his body all this other stuff is just amazing storytelling uh in and of its own right I mean they really made you be interested in a character that you wouldn't have thought twice about 
otherwise, right? Like in the, the hands of a less talented writers and creators, it would just been like, oh, this is Lex's bodyguard, go, bodyguard, go get him. Oh no, she lost to Superman, done. But no, they created in a very small amount of time, like a very relatable, tragic uh, character and backstory for Mercy. That's, I think, one of the other, you know, big picture takeaways now that I've rewatched a bunch of these episodes where the the level of sophistication um, is just so impressive in terms of the, the kinds of stories they're telling and how they're telling them and how you can have an episode like this. And I think as a kid, you know, you can watch it and, you know, wonder, oh, is Brainiac going to come back and are they going to fight and, and all that. And you can watch it now as an adult and kind of dig more into the psychology of mercy and like mm-hmm. you said, the sadly, you know, realistic, um, you know, situation that she finds herself in and, and staying in. So it works on a number of levels. And, and again, just the, yeah, the level of sophistication was, was just really, uh, really, really stood out to me and brought to life um, just impeccably by those, those voice actors uh, for sure. And I know we'll, we'll continue to talk about them as we, as we move through these episodes. You know, we talked a good bunch about, uh, you know, Brainiac and Krypton and, and the telling of the origin here. We haven't touched on Kryptonite. I have that earmarked for our episode on Lex and the supporting cast, because as much as it deals with an irradiated fragment of Krypton, I really, that's really a Lex episode. Without a doubt. But uh, before we sign off here, we have to talk about Jaxor and Mala, the Phantom mm-hmm. Zone criminals. Uh, from Blast from the Past, the two-part episode, uh, and then they make a return appearance in Absolute Power. So, well, what was your take on uh, on these uh, on these villains and the role they played? I'll I'll give it to us in a nice little soundbite here. I loved the idea. I thought both the characters were kind of, eh, you know, they didn't really grab me, grab me. I didn't think. I love. I love. The whole concept it's something we've seen before as comic book readers don't get me wrong but i love the idea you know so much of, of superman so much of this show is based on tragedy right and uh superman is such a beacon of hope usually when you think of tragedy and you think of dc the first hero that comes to most people's minds is batman right but i think the tragedy that's weaving into the show is so important for superman as that symbol of hope because you can't have hope if you didn't also have tragedy. And I think this is such an interesting, tragic situation for Superman because it's, oh my goodness, I'm not alone. There are other Kryptonians, but they're really, really, I don't want to say evil. That's a blanket term, but they are not ethically sound. They are more than likely a little, uh, their goals are not in line with what Superman would want to be aligned with. So it's, oh my goodness, I'm not alone. But they probably were locked up for good reason. And Superman still does the right thing, right? Because if you think about it, he 100% does the the ethical thing by letting them out because they were only sent to be served for a couple of years in the zone, right? Uh, only for, I think they say maybe like 20 years. And it's been far past their sentencing. So the right thing to do is to let them out also too. Of course, inevitably that leads to a whole host of problems, but it also was so interesting to see that... Um, it starts off okay. And I think that's what makes this such a good tragic story as well. If they open the door and they're like, ha surprise, back to crime. Like that's, I mean, it's lazy storytelling to do it that way. It's also so much more effective to be like, no, like we're going to be heroes together. Like we got this. And then over the course of these episodes, which again, remarkable, still very little time, like in real world time, right? These episodes running, um, you got things a two parter, right? You get 40 minutes again, give or take. We see like, oh, like she's not, she's taking this too far. It's not all there. And then of course we get that reunion and everything is just a complete hot mess again. And it's, it's such a great tragic tale uh, as well too, which is funny. Cause like you said, when you're, when you're watching it as a kid, it's like, oh man, like Superman's going to fight these guys, but they have like the same kind of power levels as them, which is also something I love. I actually love seeing Superman fight other Kryptonians because we get to see more on display something we've talked about before, which is how intelligent he is. And that also gets overshadowed when he's hanging out with Batman or Mr. Terrific or, you know, somebody else along those lines, but how he's no, no slouch intellectually uh, as well. So we do get to see him kind of, you know, use some more clever tactics, which I think is very, very cool as well too, as a fun side note, but you could just look at it 
on the surface level as a kid like that, but now as you know, adults, we're looking at this just almost like Greek tragedy of a of a tale being like, I'm not alone anymore. I got what I wanted, but be careful what you wish for. I mean, I think I would have to say I agree with with really everything. So I totally uh, I'm on board with the the tragic aspect of all of this. And, uh, you know, I play here with Brainiac, too. It's like the every connection that still exists to his world uh, is, you know, is, is not a path he can <laughs> or not a thread right. he can really follow. Right. Um, you know, Brainiac, this destroyer and collector, although, you know, at the end of that stolen uh, memories episode, uh, Superman is able to retrieve the orb with the with the the Krypton data before they're yeah. all destroyed and puts Great them cathartic moment. Yeah, yeah. So he has that, and you know, what's kind of interesting there was that you know all he had previously was that message from Jor El and Lara, which you know mm-hmm. it, you know introduced him to his birth parents and told him where he came from, but didn't give him much more it seemed and so now he has the orb and that kind of unlocks more about about krypton um and it's like yes and then there's also the phantom zone which is populated by all of the criminals who were banished there so very tragic and then on top of that i agree with you i I think for the most part i like this these episodes better in in concept than in ultimate execution but i thought that the setup was great and i think that in lesser hands um, Jaxer and Mala would have escaped. And I thought yeah. what was really, really great was that Superman made the active choice to release Mala. Cause like you said, right, he sees her through the viewfinder in the, in the mm-hmm. Phantom Zone projector. And, <clears throat> you know, she talks about her sentence and it's like, okay, I mean, that does seem it's reasonable. Fair. And he even Time goes, served. And he even goes to the orb into the Brainiac databanks and he, you know, gets the background, you know, to the extent that it's available on Mala and he makes like a relatively informed choice. And, you know, he, here he is trying to give someone a second chance. So I really, I thought this setup was great. Now, side note and not to nitpick, but the kickoff to this, right, is that Professor Hamilton, uh, so someone from the, the comics in, in the late 80s and 90s making his way to the animated show. Great. He's great. He's great, by the way. I also I love him uh, throughout this show. Yes. And so, you know, he's tinkering around with the spaceship and he finds this hidden compartment with the Phantom Zone projector. Now, again, I don't want to nitpick, but going back to the pilot, jor plan, he wanted to put everyone in the Phantom Zone and then send one person in the rocket ship to an inhabitable planet and then release them all on the new planet. Which that is was a great plan. plan. Yeah. So if he had, I mean, maybe I'm, I don't know, either maybe I'm overthinking this or I'm missing something, but if he had the Phantom Zone projector and it was in the rocket, why not use it on himself and Lara at least at the very end before they sent baby Kal-El off? I, I, again, perfectly <laughs> logical. Quite, no, it's a great question. The only thing I could offer up is maybe they were in such like an emotional panic and duress that all they were thinking about was getting uh, Kal-El out of there. But yeah. I mean, yeah, like from a rational mind, that's a great argument. Yeah. Why wouldn't they be like, well, our choices are death or getting put in the Phantom Zone. I'm going to the Phantom Zone every single time. I mean, right? right? Like it's not ideal. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but yeah. Although they had time to have that discussion about... Uh... Uh, the fact that Laura could fit in the rocket and she was like, no, I have to be here with you. One of my great nitpicks when it comes to these origin tellings. But anyway, it's the Titanic thing, it's, it goes back to Rose being on the door and there being room on the door and Leo's not on there. It's like, guys, what are we doing? Come on. Yeah. Uh, you know, exactly. But anyway, so, so I, I like the fact that, you know, uh, Superman chose to release her. There's this moment though, where again, watching it as an adult, I had a very different take on this where, <laughs> you know, Mala comes out and, He's like, you know, Krypton was destroyed. He puts his hands on his shoulder. He's like, we're the only two left. And then he tells, tells Hamilton, he's like, I have to go take her away someplace private. It's like, uh. <laughs> What's, yeah. I, I also was like, kind of, and also there's like kind of weird, like Lois is like jealous kind of, right? A little bit. I feel like, yeah, like what, are we like into like repopulation on this show? Like what are we, what are we, what, are we, what angle are we hinting at here exactly? You know, it's a little strange. Yeah, it was, you know, it was one of those things where like I, I, I took it innocently because it's Superman and it's Superman, the animated series. And I know that's the only way it was intended, but I just had this moment where I was like, if you're Professor Hamilton (laughs) or you're some outside observer, you kind of be like, what's your angle here, buddy? Uh, and, and, you know, Mala herself clearly thought that there would be some repopulation, right? Cause we do have that yeah. scene where Lois is like, oh, are you to an item? And he's, he's very quick to be like, oh, I don't know what you're yeah. talking about. And, you know, she really takes offense at that. 
Bala. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so anyway, now the, sort of the elephant in the room when we're talking about these Phantom Zone villains, <clears throat> they're not Zod and Feora or Ursa. And why? That's that's my my next question. Why is that? Because I think that you're 100 percent right. That's the elephant in the room. I'm just like, why is this not Zod? And there has to be a reason, right? I, I don't know what the reason is, but I'm assuming there's a reason why we actively didn't use Zod in that scenario, right? Because that would have been it. I would have thought. So we were at this point in time in the comics, right, where Superman had to be the sole survivor, and the Zod. And the, there were two other uh, criminals with him, not Feora or Ursa, someone else, and, and a, another male villain, who we got in uh, the John Byrne's final arc on the books. They existed in a pocket universe, the same pocket universe where the protoplasm that would eventually become Supergirl was created, right? It's very convenient. So they had a version of Zod, but it wasn't like the Zod from the same Krypton that our Superman came from. Um. So there's that at play, but at the same time, they did use Kryptonian villains in the animated series. I mean, they were Kryptonians right. from the Phantom Zone, from the same Krypton that Kal-El came from. And um, I'll be honest, I had I did a little Wikipedia here. Jaxor was a was a, a villain in pre-crisis continuity and has made some post-crisis appearances as well. He was a scientist who destroyed a moon. Um, so they basically glommed the Zod characteristics and motivation that he's power hungry military leader. Like they kind of just mm -hmm, mm -hmm. transplanted that onto Jaxor here, but he was a villain, you know, in the comics. Um, and Mala, I think was a, like a different character and was, a was, was not a woman, I, I think, uh, you know, and they just kind of use that name here for her. So I don't know. So it's like, if we're able to, so like they are, they are actually Kryptonians and they're based on characters who, I don't know why they couldn't be, I don't know if that was a restriction imposed by DC or if the producers were like, oh, we want to use different characters because Zod, you know, was so well known. I don't know, <laughs> honestly. These, these are the, I feel like we always come across when we're uh, looking at um, like these shows now. Mm -hmm. Now we've done a whole bunch of uh, looks at a bunch of different episodes over two decades at this point where we do come up with these questions that are so much fun to ask and we'll never get the answers to, right? It's just, it's so interesting to me. Like were they, I know like throughout a large part of the 90s, like a lot of um, like Superman movie ideas were in development as well as been like well documented was that something like hey we're really trying to do something with zod behind closed doors we don't want you to use him at all here i mean that's the thing it's fun to speculate but we don't know but uh it definitely is the elephant in the room when you think of phantom zone the first person all of us think of is zod i mean that's it and that's the story traditionally at least how you know we're we're exposed to it so um i wonder how it would have changed the episode if at all if they did use zod that's the thing. I don't think it really would have for me. Right. Because structurally, we're still hitting the same beats. It's still that same like militaristic, power hungry, you know, conqueror. It's just a name swap almost, right? And I know Jaxar was a, a comic uh, character already to begin with, but it does sound like it's just kind of like a name swap for the whatever reason unbeknownst to us uh, that it occurred. Yes. I, so that's the thing. I, you know, I think as a fan, it's like, yeah, I guess it would have been cool if it had been Zod and Feora or Zod and Ursa. But I don't think, it, honestly, I don't think it would have made a difference because I think all the same pieces were still in play. You know, um, you know, as far as the ultimate execution, I, again, I do like, like you said, the the tr I think the first part was stronger, right? Because, yeah. yep. you know, as the viewer, it's like, you you know, this won't end well, but at the same time, like you don't, you don't know exactly how it's going to unfold. I, you know, it may, I don't know. Part of me is like, maybe that's the reason they use different characters because it's like, mm, cause then you don't know. You're not positive. It's like if Feora right. comes out or Ursa comes out, it's like, mm, you know, this can really only go one way. Right. Well, the we name, know who they are. The name Mala doesn't really inspire much confidence. You figure it'll probably be bad. <laughs> you don't yeah. know for sure. Right. Right. <laughs> Um, so I don't know, maybe there was a little bit of that at play, but I, I did think that the first part where, you know, he's trying to, you know, he teaches her how to use her powers and, uh, instructs her not to use them to hurt people. And, you know, she misinterprets all of this and, and assumes that Superman is the ruler of earth. And you know what? Yeah. The, I did have this moment where I was like, eh, I, I kind of get it. Well, like from her, like from her perspective, you know, no one like <clears throat> he, he seems to do as he pleases. 
you know, uh, you know, sure. perf- Hamilton seems to, you know, is, is obviously, you know, affords him a great deal of, uh, of, of deference. Clearly he has this power mm-hmm. that's far beyond anything else uh, on the planet. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think it's like such a crazy conclusion she comes to. <laughs> no, especially from what her background is on Krypton and like how that hierarchy and structure was there. It does make sense where she is at fault is not uh understanding when given every single chance to right like that's the <laughs> yeah. problem it goes from it goes from oh i'm new in town to oh i've been here for a while and i don't care how things are here here's how they're gonna be and that's that transition we see over the course of that first of that two-parter episode right and then of course she ultimately uh you know uh, releases jaxer and then there, we have the battle in the second part and through various you know ruses superman is eventually able to uh you know, banish both of them back to the to the Phantom Zone, and you know, then they return in the Absolute Power episode. Which, I mean, I I, I I've seen all of the episodes because again, I, even if I didn't catch it when it was first on, I did that rewatch. You know, when I was in high school or college, but I had next to no memory of Absolute Power, if not for the fact that I had done a little bit of research and I knew those two were in this. I like I was watching like, where is this going? I did not remember it at all. <laughs> You know what it reminded me of? What? I bet you you're going to be able to guess, especially as I start saying this. When we watched the Ruby Spears show, the very last episode, I believe it is, and it was just bonkers with him going to different planets and this whole high concept sci-fi thing. It immediately reminded me of that episode where it was, I thought that episode was cool. Both of them. I thought both of those episodes are cool, but I was also like, what are we doing here? <laughs> like, this just seems so out of left field. It's so removed and detached from a great deal of uh, of what... Now, we get a little bit of, of Lois and Jimmy as well in that episode too, right? Don't we get a little bit in that episode at some point? Or is it just all completely him in the ship? Oh, and then absolute... going to the whole... Yeah, an absolute power. No, it's just him in the ship. Unless It's I'm all really him. Blanking. So we don't even get... So we get zero supporting cast. Which is what I, I wanted to double check with you before I made that statement. So it's completely removed from everything, his bedrock as well, too. And it really just comes out of such left field. And it's an interesting story about freedom and revolution and what they've been up to. So much of what happens in the show seems necessary. I don't know if any of that was necessary to the larger show uh, as a whole. You know, we checked in on those characters and then they. I don't want to say died, but it ends up with them going in that black hole, right? They go out and get stretched. Who knows what happens to them? I wasn't clamoring to see what happened to those characters next. You know, I was much more interested in pretty much every other supporting character that that we had and other reoccurring villains and stuff like that. But yeah, it's just it's funny. It really struck me with that that Ruby Spears episode and this episode that they both are just like this. We're going on a trip, like high concept, high sci fi to other planets out of left field, and let's stretch our legs a little bit. But it definitely stands out from uh, the majority of other episodes in the run. I think because of that. You know, I'm glad you said that because I don't know, I don't know that I necessarily had that impression upon watching it. But now that you're saying it, it's like, yeah, it does feel a bit like an outlier. It, it also one thing that I did clock was that it's one of the only episodes, and the late Mister Kent, I think, might, is is maybe the only other one that begins with narration from Superman, where you know he's explaining how he's out in space in his ship. Um, working with Star Labs to do research on this black hole. And, you know, then he ends up on this, you know, he rescues the ship that's about to be pulled into the black hole, Mm -hmm. traces, you know, sends them back to the planet they came from. And, you know, again, for us, the audience, if we haven't read a description of it ahead of time, you know, we don't know what's going on here, right? The people on the ship who he's rescued, they're afraid of him. He looks like the people who Mm -hmm. have subjugated them, but we don't know who they are yet. And then, of course, we find out it's Jaxer and Mala. They very conveniently were freed from the phantom zone when two meteors collided in front of a black hole. I guess that that'll do the trick. And, you know, they've, they've taken Uh. over this planet. I think the, the one interesting and surprising thing about this episode was that Superman was ready to leave. Yeah. Yes. He was ready to be like, this isn't my, I'm paraphrasing here, of course, but this isn't my jurisdiction. It's not my problem. You know, Earth is my I'm, I'm talking like a Green Lantern now, but you know, Earth Earth is my jurisdiction. You know, it's not my problem. They seem like they have it sorted here. And you're right. And I wonder, I wonder why. 
I wish we spent, and I know there's such a little time. I wish we spent a little more time kind of understanding why he would do that. Was he just so eager to get back home? Did he know deep down like what a fight would actually look like there and maybe the cost to other lives that would happen as well too? It's interesting to think about, but you're, you're completely right. That's the most interesting and surprising thing in that whole episode. It, you know, and it's funny because I, I, I guess the episode didn't make that much of an impression or maybe it made more of an impression than it did because now I'm thinking about all of these things and, you know, he does say, there's one of the freedom fighters who confronts him as he's leaving and he says to her, he's like, you know, a battle between me and these two would would destroy your world basically, mm-hmm. a la Man of Steel and, and <laughs> Clark versus Zod. So, I, I mean, that seems to be at play, you know, and I'm, or I'm probably reading too much into this, but then you also wonder, it's like, well... I don't know, is there more behind, like, does he think he can't win? Is is it that aspect of, like, this isn't my jurisdiction? I mean, the the Jaxer and Mala, they do make this point to him of, like, we're not on Earth, like, this is not your planet. And I guess, like, in fairness to Superman, he sees that they're not, they're not kind to the people who are serving them. And, you know, he makes that note about, like, you know, no one seems to be smiling down there. But at the same mm-hmm. time, from what they've described and what he's seen, they're you know, maybe they're okay rulers. I mean, I, I mean, like, I don't know if that's kind of in his mind as well. Like, it's hard to say exactly. If the only thing that is truly articulated by Superman is like, we would destroy your planet if we fought. So I'm just mm-hmm. going to go. Mm-hmm. But obviously he stays and he defeats them. And like you said, they get sucked into the black hole. At the end of the episode, we get that closing narration from Superman. And he has that quote about all it takes for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And it's like, yeah. He needed to. He needed to have that reminder in this episode. And yeah, to he your, was almost very much did nothing. He was very almost that person to let it happen. So to your question, I wonder if the answer was like, look, at the end of the day, as much as we will analyze this over and over, I mean, it, it is ultimately a kids' cartoon, and maybe that was maybe that's why they had this episode and why he was ready. Like that was the lesson that they wanted the audience to, to come away with. I, don't know. I, I think that's that's an excellent point, and it's it's a fantastic lesson. It it really is. Uh, it's a one shot, is what I feel like. You know, based on like how we look at it as as comic book fans and comic book readers, right? It's like a one shot, like a an episode, or a, you know, like a, maybe like um, it really it really does. It feels like something completely different. But I think you're right. I think you're onto something very much so there, where it almost seems like where that that quote maybe was embedded into one of the writers of the show, right? Or one of the creators. And that informed the rest of the episode. They're like, this is a story I still think we need to tell. Because you're right. And that is a message worth saying and worth displaying. And if even Superman can wrestle with that, it means that it's okay for the rest of us to wrestle with it as well. Yeah. I think that brings us to the end of our mixtape on Krypton and Brainiac and the Phantom Zone villains. You know... I I guess I somewhat debated starting with these episodes because like I said, historically, the, the Krypton part of the story has not been my favorite, but it's where the animated series begins. And like mm-hmm. I said, I've really come around on, uh, you know, the Kryptonian aspect to the mythology and rewatching these episodes, I think further cemented that. I'm really a fan of, of what these episodes did. Are they necessarily my favorite of the series? No, there's so like, there's a lot coming that I would, I would probably put ahead of it, but I really enjoy this, and I think those first couple episodes in particular laid a great foundation and built out aspects of this world that would continue to be explored moving forward. It gave us, for you and me, the most compelling version of Brainiac, uh, who's really this stark counterpoint to the last son of Krypton um, and tied their their origins and characters together, I think, in a really impactful way um, and gave us a twist on on the traditional Zod story that worked in, in large respect, um, maybe not so much in others, but still gave us some interesting fodder for discussion for sure. So is there anything else you want to say before we sign off? This show set such a good foundation for what was to come. And like any Superman story or any story in general, that's so important. And I think you you, you hit the nail on the head. And my goodness, have you and I looked at origin stories quite a bit. <laughs> And it gets a point where you're just like, okay, I've seen this already. I know what's going to happen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you cannot have everything that comes after without that good foundation. And I think this show, Superman the Animated Series, proves that in the right hands, 
you can tell a compelling Superman origin story. You can tell a compelling Krypton story as well. And I encourage everybody to uh, to go give them a look. I mean, they really just do such a wonderful job of of not only setting the scene, but setting storylines that continue to go well on into the future. Well said. Thank you so much uh, for taking part in this. I can't wait until next week for volume two of Superman, the animated mixtapes. So thank you to Jeremy. Thank you to the audience. Make sure you come back next week for volume two. And until then, remember, it's about what you do. It's about action.